Well, good morning, church. Uh, we are so delighted that you're joining us for our time of corporate worship, scripture, and prayer today. And we trust that you will be refreshed and encouraged. We have a pretty exciting morning planned, and it's not all captured on this video. You are also welcome uh, to join us for Zoom Church today at 10 a.m. Pacific Time for an interactive workshop called Worship, Music and Beyond with Simon Goff. We want to consider again what it means to lead a congregation in worship. How do we keep our servant heart centered on what is most important for us to retain and where we can expand our horizons and expressions of worship with other features and ways of participating? We have spent nearly 16 months apart. So we are a changed people. We will be meeting in a new space with some new faces. And as we plan to regather, let's think about how we participate in the faith community and recognize that each of us has something to bring as an offering of worship to God. So this morning, let us consider the words of Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, the starry host by the breath of his mouth. So let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And let's join in a prayer together. Creator, in the stillness of this day, we ask that you will be an oasis for those drawing near. Come reveal yourself as God, the sovereign one, high above all circumstances and strong in our weakness. You are the all-sufficient one. You are the restorer. Come restore us, these souls, these weary travelers. You have granted us the privilege of communion with you and with our fellow believers. That thank you for your grace and mercy towards us because this in turn opens our hearts to the needs of others. And we know we share this earth with so many who are homeless, hungry, addicted, abused, suffering, and grieving. Give us your imagination, your generosity, compassion, and love. Help us to work together as agents of healing in this broken world. Pour out your spirit of perseverance as we journey towards freedom on behalf of those who are suffering. Allow us to see your face. And let our hearts not be turned to stone, but give us a new heart and a new mind as we worship you, that we as your people would reflect your glory. Amen. Hi, Willow's family. Melissa here. I wanted to share a liturgy with you from the book, Every Moment Holy. And the name of it is A Liturgy for the Ritual of Morning Coffee. Meet me, O Christ, in the stillness of morning. Move me, O Spirit, to quiet my heart. Mend me, O Father, from yesterday's harms. From the discords of yesterday, resurrect my peace. From the discouragements of yesterday, resurrect my hope. From the weariness of yesterday, resurrect my strength. From the doubts of yesterday, resurrect my faith. From the wounds of yesterday, resurrect my love. Let me enter this new day aware of my need and awake to your grace, O Lord. Amen.
Isaiah 58, 9 to 12. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger, and the malicious talk. And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and will strengthen your flame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. You'll likely be familiar with this song. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. So that song dates back to the late 90s, <laughs> born from a period of apathy within Matt Redmond's home church in England. The congregation was struggling to find meaning in its musical outpouring at the time. It was doing really significant things. But the pastor decided to get rid of the sound system and the band for a season, and they gathered with just their voices, stripping everything away would allow them to get back to the heart of worship. The church family was meant to be producers in worship, not just consumers. And their pastor bravely asked, when you come through the doors on a Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to God? And the question initially led to some rather embarrassing silence. But eventually people broke out into an a cappella song and heartfelt prayers encountering God in a fresh way. And before too long, they were able to reintroduce the musicians and the sound system, but not until they had gained a new perspective that worship is all about Jesus. And this God-oriented response can be drawn from the depths of our souls, no matter what the circumstance or setting. The Heart of Worship song simply describes what occurred when the music faded and everything was stripped away. And Matt Redman wrote the song really quickly in his bedroom soon after the church's journey together with no grand intentions by any means for it to become an international anthem. He viewed the word simply as his personal subjective response to what he was learning about worship. But when Matt shared the heart of worship with his pastor, they recognized that a few small adjustments to the lyrics would mean that any member of the church could relate to it as well. And God has since taken the song around the world for his purposes, just letting the song breathe. And eventually it became a new standard of the modern worship music movement. And the themes of reverence and wonder and mystery are elevated in worship. In the book of Revelation and in the revelation experienced and recorded by the Apostle John, we read that day and night, these living creatures never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We read that the elders lay their crowns around the throne saying, you are worthy our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain 
And with your blood you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. And 10,000 times 10,000 angels encircled the throne and in loud voices sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and under the seas and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Whoever looks at the glory of God finds themselves face down in worship. In the presence of the divine, our smallness is revealed. Our frailty, our misunderstanding, our lack of knowledge and insight into how the world works, into how our solar system moves within our galaxy. In the presence of the divine, we are overcome. And yet the divine reaches out for us, longs to be in relationship with us, and demonstrates that we are known and that we are loved. And in the presence of the divine, the unity of humankind is also revealed. When we recognize God's presence, human hearts respond in worship. And all of our religious traditions, our rituals, our practices, our songs, our scriptures, our prayers, try to just point us towards God. These methods don't define, they don't limit God in any way, but they are a diverse means of grace that allows us to engage and participate with the divine. And we naturally respond to God's faithfulness towards us and towards all of creation with worship and we look forward to the fullness of the kingdom God's reign over all the earth and we long for this like the Israelite people long to return to the promised land they long for the freedom to worship and to celebrate again with God's people and so over and over the prophet Jeremiah speaks and writes down the prophecies from God about the end of the exile Let's read a little bit from chapter 31 of Jeremiah. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I will build you up again and you will be rebuilt, O Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. And there will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob, shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. For the Lord will ransom Jacob and redeem them from the hand of the stronger than they. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord. The grain, the new wine and the oil, the young of the flocks and herds, they will be like a well-watered garden and they will sorrow no more. Then maidens will dance and be glad, young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priests with abundance, and my people will be filled with my bounty, declares the Lord. 
No matter what we journey through, ultimately we cling to this hope that God sees and that God cares and that God will set things right. Amidst the heartache, amidst the sorrow, and amidst the turmoil, our hope is in God. And when we experience the presence of God and catch just this glimpse of God's perspective, our unity as human beings is revealed. We recognize our connection to others and we are unified in this longing to worship, longing to celebrate, to relax, and to know that all manner of things shall be well. A time when goodness and mercy will flow. And yes, we recognize that we haven't arrived there yet. Humanity has these open, gaping wounds all over the place and creation groans and we read the news and we lament over and over again. Our naivety and our innocence, if it ever existed, and the ability to focus only on living the good life, that's definitely been shattered. We are all part of the suffering humanity. We can no longer turn a blind eye and say, that doesn't affect me and go on about our day. We are in this together. And though we may be equipped with very different boats, we are in the same storm and we have the same creator. We are part of the human family. It's undeniable. We are connected with the grieving of the indigenous peoples over their missing and murdered children the genocide of their people over seven generations. We are connected with the grieving Muslim family in Ontario who are targets of a hate crime. We are connected with the billions of people around the world still waiting for their chance at a vaccine. And we say, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy because often all the other words simply fail us. And so we pray and we lament and we worship and we connect to the only one who can and who will set things right. And I think we're invited to see this text in Jeremiah, the promised rescue out of exile and the return of the people of God as a promise to a universal Israel, not just a political one or even a religious one. The fact is we are a scattered people. We human beings have been scattered all over the earth, scattered from one another in our hearts as well as in our minds. Seeing differences that divide us, constructing barriers and labels and sharply defining who is like us and who is unlike us. And of course, we've been physically scattered from one another during COVID as well. And we are looking forward to our physical regathering as a church community in just a few weeks. But what Jeremiah records is the promise of God who scattered the people will bring them all home again. Will bring us together again, gathering us all as a shepherd gathers her flock. This is not expected to be a neat or really easy homecoming. Someone once described the kingdom of God as a glorious mess, a holy confusion, an improvisational dance, a long and unpredictable jazz riff in which every person is an instrument. And so centuries after Jesus, the music does continue ever more complex, ever more beautiful as the melodies are woven together as the people of God continue to worship. And so when we participate in the body of Christ here on earth, when we unite ourselves with a worshiping faith community, we find ourselves just mixed in with an extraordinarily odd collection of people. And there are surprises we uncover with diversity, different insights, different perspectives, different preferences. 
but we join a great sea of people thirsting after God. Right across the spectrum, in every dimension and in between. Yes, differences in ethnicity, age, education, ability, politics, economics, gender, sexuality, family status, employment, and language. In the light of God's full presence, we will finally see ourselves as we are in unity. And we see the reality of the relationship between humanity and the divine and how we are all God's children. And even now, the kingdom life has begun. The restoration of the family of God has begun. Jesus came to us. Jesus abides with us still through the gift of the Spirit. The door is open and we are all welcomed in. And we can get a glimpse of how life can be when the barriers have fallen. The psychological barriers, the political barriers, the social barriers, theological barriers, and economic barriers. When the whosoever will may come. And so together we worship the only one who can and who will set things right. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. May that be your prayer today. Amen.